indeed, and for that matter, the NBA, is something that I believe will be critical over the coming years in taking forward the kinds of medicines that I and my colleagues uh, work to develop. Um, the fact that this is a group focused on stem cells is another important um, reason why I'm really delighted to be here, because the field of stem cell research, which was really not stem cell therapy back then, um, you know, was already a very established discipline within the biomedical research community 20 years ago when I started to think about the ideas that I'll be presenting to you today. And um, it was the only one that was. As you will see in a moment, the, uh, the work that we do is a very much a divide and conquer approach that details the developing and bringing together of a wide variety of different medical uh, modalities of which stem cell therapy is very much one, uh, but all the others of which are very much ones that were not at all um, uh, high profile established disciplines when I started to think this way. And so in a sense, um, this means that the work that I've done and that my colleagues have done has to some extent deprioritized uh, stem cell research actually. Um, but very much not because we don't think it's important, rather because it's doing so well anyway. And our goal is to let the other things catch up so that this divide and, divide and conquer approach can work. All right, so um, let me, uh, first of all, there we go, start by telling you what we don't work on. Because if you uh, look me up online, you'll find that I do a lot of public interfacing, a lot of talk to general audiences and so on, and to the media. And of course, the media are paid to sell papers, which means they are paid to be sensationalist. And the result is that a great deal of hay is made about the kinds of things that I think are going to happen in the end, if and when, as and when, we succeed in bringing aging under really comprehensive medical control. And of course, most of that focus is around this what we might call side effect of medical control of aging, which is people are quite likely to live a lot longer. Because let's face it, you know, at the moment, the vast majority of people in the developed world and even in the developing world increasingly do die of the health problems associated with late life. And therefore, if those health problems didn't happen, if people remained biologically, uh, both mentally and physically, of course, uh, in a state comparable to young adults, then mortality rates would not increase with chronological age because biological age would not be increasing. And uh, of course that would have a huge impact on longevity, but it's just a side effect. We are medical researchers just like you guys. Um, and we do not focus on longevity for the sake of longevity. Um, so, you know, this is the kind of thing that I have to cope with day in, day out when I speak to the general public and journalists and politicians and, and so on. People will say all these things on the left about the, you know, the, the issues that they have, the reasons they have for hesitation and ambivalence about this work. On the, uh, and, they, and they all ultimately come down to consequences of this side effect, this longevity side effect. They'll say things like, oh dear, where will we put all the people if everyone stops dying? And, you know, won't dictators live forever? And won't it be boring? And, you know, doesn't death give meaning to life? And so on. Which kind of isn't the kind of, kind of reaction that people get when they say they're working on curing Alzheimer's or, you know, curing um, osteoporosis or something. So I hope you have a little sympathy for the kind of bullets I have to take every day. Um, but, of course, the answer is, you know, these are reasonable questions. But at the end of the day, they have to be answered in the context of the real purpose of this work, which is to keep people healthy, which is, you know, not terribly controversial as a goal of society. All right. So I came into this field as an engineer. I was originally a computer scientist and I switched to becoming a gerontologist only in around the age of 30. Um, and that has been enormously helpful to me because it meant that I can address the very hard questions associated with aging in a manner that is somewhat different than the typical approach that is taken by those who have been 
biologist, all that, all that. I guess I'm a bit more like, I think more like a technologist rather than a basic scientist. And that is enormously helpful. The first way in which it was helpful is that I asked, I, I asked what has turned out, I think, to be the right questions. And the first question that we want to ask today is, what is so difficult about aging? Why is it that the health problems of late life have been so refractory to any kind of intervention by, medic, by medicine, even though over the past 200 years, we have made such enormous progress in overcoming the health problems that used to affect people early in life. And of course, that still affect people to some extent. But, you know, I mean, let's remember the statistics here. In you know, 200 years ago, in the wealthiest countries in the world, more than one third of babies would die before the age of one. And of course, they'd die of things like, you know, tuberculosis and diphtheria and so on. And people would die at huge, huge rates in childbirth and throughout life. And we fix that by the most ridiculously elementary means, if we think about it. You know, just figuring out that hygiene is a good idea saved the most insane number of lives. And simple medicines like vaccines and antibiotics and even mosquito nets, of course, you know, still saving huge numbers. So, um, you know, what's so different about aging? Why have simple measures of this kind been so unsuccessful? Now, most people think they know the answer, and that's probably why the question is so rarely asked. Of course, you're not supposed to be able to read this slide. The point I'm making here is simply that, um, you know, that so many things go wrong with us late in life. And of course, they go wrong at more or less the same time, which means they interact with each other, they exacerbate each other. So, you know, the sheer complexity of the problem seems like a reasonable explanation for why the problem has overwhelmed the medical profession in terms of their ability to get on top of the issues. Now, of course, that is definitely part of the problem. I'm not saying it isn't. But uh, actually, I would say that it's only a secondary part of the problem. And the main problem is something completely different. So in order to introduce the main problem, I have to start in this crazy way. I have to actually give you a definition of aging. That's completely crazy if you think about it, isn't it? Because aging, let's face it, it's been the number one preoccupation of humanity since the beginning of civilization. And here we are, if you ask 10 people, what aging is, you'll get a very wide variety of different answers. It's just insane that that's the case, but it is. So here is my definition of aging. And of course, the purpose here is not only to make sure that we're all on the same page during this talk, but also to ensure that everyone you know, appreciates that aging is not a mystery. This is a demystifying definition. Aging is simply a combination of the two processes that I am depicting very simply at the bottom of the slide. First of all, the process that goes on throughout life, literally starting before we're born, um, whereby our metabolism generates various changes to the molecular and cellular structure to, of, the, of the body, and those changes accumulate throughout life. And that's why eventually, late in life, we have the right-hand process, where this damage eventually kicks off and drives the chronic progressive conditions that we associate with aging. Uh, you know, the only reason that happens is because the body is set up to tolerate a certain amount of these changes that metabolism progressively causes. Um, but eventually, you know, there's too much of that, more than what the body is set up to tolerate. So, um, you know, this is a very, very simple definition, but it's honestly the truth. And that's all you need in order to understand why what I'm showing you on this table has a huge and really important mistake in it. Here's a, a, a table that I think summarizes quite well what most people would say, and here I mean most people inside the medical profession as well as lay people. If you ask them, in what ways can somebody be sick? Um, of course, here I'm excluding uh, mental illness uh, you know, I'm really just talking about physical things, but bear with me. People would say, well, okay, there's obviously there's infectious diseases, that's column one. Then there's congenital diseases, obviously, you know, rare, but nevertheless very serious, that's column two. And then there's the big one, the chronic progressive conditions of late life, like Alzheimer's, arthritis, all the things I put up in very small font a few minutes ago. 
And then most people would say, and I feel this is true in the medical profession as well, most people would say that way out in the stratosphere, there is this completely separate thing called aging itself, which consists of these rather poorly defined phenomena like frailty, and which is kind of intuitively completely different from disease, so different that it's kind of off limits to medicine in people's minds, in people's intuitions, which is of course appalling because it means that people aren't gonna be very interested in trying to develop such medicines to actually uh, um, eliminate or even alleviate the things in column four. So this is what happens, geriatric medicine. Almost everything that society does, almost all the money that's spent, all the effort that goes into trying to keep people healthy late in life consists of what I'm here calling geriatrics. And that's defined in terms of my definition of aging as simply directly attacking the pathologies of late life as if they were infections, essentially trying to eliminate them from the body um, so that, you know, as to, cure the, to cure them, right? Um, now, you can just look at this little diagram for no time at all and see that that's completely crazy. Anything that comes under that heading, anything that directly addresses pathology is directly addressing the consequence of something that's accumulating, this damage, right? And therefore, by definition, any form of geriatric medicine is certain to become progressively less effective as the patient gets older. It's just brain dead. So you know, why do we do it? Why do we still f fixate on this one way of keeping people healthy late in life? Well, you know, one might think, well, maybe there's no alternative. Uh, you'll see shortly that that's certainly not the case. And then one might say instead, one might say, well, okay, um, you know, uh, if there is an alternative, you know, what is it? You know, why shouldn't we do it? But I don't think that that's good enough. I think that the real reason why people are fixated on geriatric medicine is because of the uh, error in this table that I put up earlier. Here, I have corrected it. And if you look closely, you will see that all of the columns are just the same as before. The only thing that is different than before is the location of that big thick black line. And that's really critical because it tells you two things. It highlights, first of all, that there is actually an enormous difference between column three and column one. We should not expect to be able to have an impact on the things in column three, the chronic progressive diseases of late life, um, by using the same kind of medicine that works so well against infections. Um, but perhaps the even bigger thing that moving the black line tells you is that there is no difference no meaningful difference between column three and column four. They're just the same. The, the only difference is semantic, that column three consists of the aspects of aging that we have chosen to give disease-like names to. And that's all. So that means, first of all, it completely you know, disposes of the idea that column four is, not, is, is off limits to medicine, because no one's gonna try and say that column three is off limits to medicine. But it also gives us some ideas about what we might do. So um, everything I've said so far is by no means original with me. Uh, I mean, perhaps this definition of aging is better than most people's, but the point is that more than a century ago, some people, a few people started to realize that geriatric medicine was never gonna work. And they said, well, okay, we've gotta be more preventative. And what they did was they said, well, okay, look, we're trying to keep people healthy late in life. What that really means in these terms is we are trying to separate metabolism from pathology. We're trying to allow people to continue actually doing metabolism, in other words, being alive, as they like, uh, without exhibiting the pathologies of late life that we see naturally. And we've established that it's a mugs game to try to separate metabolism from pathology by separating damage from pathology. <coughs> so why don't we try instead separating metabolism from damage? And the logic of this was, the inspiration of this was, of course, the living world. The fact that in nature, we see a huge variation between different species in terms of the rate at which metabolism generates damage. The um, you know, long-lived species, just essentially they run more cleanly. They 